This is a company that she had taken over from her father. And uh, yeah, I think for all of the people in the room who have been maybe a bit frustrated with the idea of only law people or lawyers who are talking to us, we have someone tonight with a business background, <laughs> albeit somebody who wrote a thesis related to legal tech and sort of developments in the industry, shifts and changes within a German context. So with that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, quick disclaimer, I'm having a cold, so I can't have to do a little break. Don't worry, I'll continue eventually. So I'm very happy to be here today to tell you a bit about our company, Leecare. Um, what does Leecare do? Well, basically, we develop software for legal departments. And our company is more than 30 years old. And on this picture, you see myself and my father, who actually founded the business here in Hamburg. And yes, our focus mainly is practice management software. So that's matter management, contract management, etc., which I show you in a while as well. A bit of my background, as I was just introduced, I'm not a lawyer, which is, um, yeah, doesn't happen that often in the legal tech space. I have a business background and a very diverse business background. I started with normal business studies, then I went a little bit into finance and into strategy, and eventually ended up doing uh, corporate innovation related to our family business, actually. I worked in all kinds of industries, which is very common if you are in the business industry. No worries. Um, so I worked from startups like Rocket Internet, Zalora, that's like Zalando in Southeast Asia, to uh, consulting companies, to banking. I worked for logistics companies and publishing. So I had a, a good view of all kinds of different business fields. However, as you can see, I never worked in a law firm or a legal department. However, uh, I ended up writing my master thesis about legal tech, and that is due to our family business background. Uh, because I was talking to my father, I was like, yeah, I have to write this thesis, I'm doing a master in innovation and entrepreneurship, you know, what should I write about? And he was like, ah, oh, why don't you look into legal tech? I was like, yeah, okay, why not? And at that time, it was like, almost like more than three years ago when we were discussing it, nobody was really talking about legal tech, but ironically, our company has been doing legal tech for more than 30 years. However, it was not called like that. So I, I ended up uh, writing this thesis, which was very interesting for me as an introduction to the whole industry, even though I obviously knew our company very well. And as a result, uh, also after taking over the company, uh, I was named Woman of Legal Tech in 2018, which I was very proud of because most of these other women actually have a law background and I didn't. Um, well, enough about myself, let's talk about LeCare. So what we do is that we provide software for corporate legal departments. And we have big customers ranging from Lufthansa to big publishing customers, but actually we are a very, very small company. We're a family business and we fit all in this boat. This is the boat of my father. This was one of our Christmas cards. And this was our re most recent Christmas card where all of our employees, most of them somewhere else, uh, looked out of the window. And this is actually situated in Eppendorf, if you know the station, it's Kellinghusenstrasse. And so we all sit in the left house, but we actually cater to the very large customer base. What do we do? Well, we first started in the 80s. You have to imagine 80s, there was nothing about the cloud, no Google, no nothing. My father developed the first Windows law firm solution, and it was very, it was really the beginning of software in general. He also, not being a lawyer, thought, well, he had a lot of friends who were lawyers said, well, guys, you know, the paper's great, but you, you really should digitalize, yeah, in the 80s. And that went very well, because in the 90s, we then sold this company to Datev, which is now a very, very large provider, especially in the tech software business. We then had a non-competitive clause, so we said, okay, law firms is what Datev do. We focus on legal departments and started to develop our current solution, LeCare, at the beginning of the 2000s. And by now we've had several generations of our software, obviously, within almost 20 years. And um, yeah, by now it's cloud-based and you can use it on any type of device. And that is how quickly the software industry actually changes. We have more than 450 customers, um, mostly in Germany, Austria and Switzerland. Of course, some as well in the Benelux area and some very international customers like in Singapore or Mexico. So we're also going more and more international. Yeah, this is an excerpt of our, of our customer list. This is obviously not all of them, most of them we can't name. Uh, we have uh, we've signed very strict NDAs. Um, however, as you can see, it's a very diverse group of customers, all kinds of industries, and these are obviously the very big customers which you recognize, 
but we also have a lot of customers which are very small, small, middle, and medium-sized companies which you've never heard of, which are super interesting and also have a legal department. Um, this is an overview of the kind of industries our customers are in, and as you can see, it's not just typical companies, but also like authorities, associations, trade unions, service providers, and all types of companies you can actually tell. And interestingly, um, most of our customers are referred to us by other customers. So it's a business to business model, um, which means that if you do big advertisements on buses and everything, or on Facebook, it's probably not gonna be that effective because most people won't care. But it's more about the, the people, the lawyers and the legal departments who actually use it. They exchange about those things on conferences or when they meet each other. And this is actually the most beneficial way for us or the most effective way for us to get gather new customers. So what do we do? Well, you all know this for sure, um, and that is actually still very present in most law firms and most legal departments. And well, 30 years ago, my dad thought, well, maybe let's digitalize that. So in the core of what we do is a matter management, a practice management, there are many types. You can also say a case management, it's, it's basically the same thing um, for legal departments. Um, as I already said, it's cloud-based and device agnostic. That means you can work from it on the go, from your tablet or your phone, or on your browser, on your computer, when you're in the office or at home as well. It depends on your company. What do we do? So this is our product suite. In the core, as I said, we have the matter management, and then we have a lot of different modules which complement this matter management. Because you have to think about in the legal department, they don't just have a case and have the documents for the case, and that's it, but they also have uh, legal spend management, like all the billing related to the law firms, they have contract matter management, so all these contracts you have internally, HR contracts, or with suppliers, there are a lot of different contracts, trust me, and you have IP management, if, you're, uh, if your company registers a new brand or trademark, you also have to manage that, when does it expire, etc., and so on and so on. We also have two complementary uh, products, which is for the compliance and the data protection department, because they have become increasingly important and have become standalone departments and companies as well. So we have two tools to also meet their needs. So here an overview of how our software actually looks like. This is the dashboard when you log in. You can also configure it to your needs. You don't have to see everything, only what you like. You have here your reminders, appointments, and deadlines. It will remind you, oh, today is the deadline to send this to the court, etc. Then you have all your matter files on the top, the ones you just recently uh, worked on, and you can, what is very important, you can actually search for stuff, and you really don't have to underestimate how important that is. If you have paper, it's very hard to search for things. In the digital world, it's very easy. <laughs> then you can create new files, etc. So let's have a look. This is the classical matter file, and you can uh, fill it with all the data that is related to a matter. And some matters need a lot of data, some don't. And you can also relate different matters to each other to build like matter groups if you have a very complex case or a long progress process or different companies involved. And it's very, very customizable. You have many different uh, registers up there where you can add more and more data. I won't go through all of them because that's quite boring, especially if you're not a user yourself. However, as you can see, there are a lot of data you can, you can put in. For example, the people who are related to that matter, they are called the related clients. So you can have, you can say, this is our side, this is the, the opposing side, you can classify them, you can uh, store all the contact data to them. And this is very important when you generate documents, and I have, I have a view of how that looks like later on. When you have your templates, you can automatically fill in the contact data that you have stored in a specific matter. So that's very convenient when you have to work on a lot of different tasks and just simply want to create this and this template document for this specific matter file. What else do we have? We always have document management system because that has to replace the whole paper. And you can filter according to all different kinds, according to document type. You also have uh, folders where you can sort your documents into. You can do that automatically as well. Basically, all types of data and all types of documents and files 
can be stored there. We have automatic integration with Office, with Outlook and Word. So if you get an email, there's a pop-up which says, ah, do you want to save it to this and this meta file? And if there's this email that you put into the data in the meta file, if it recognizes that, or if the, the number of the meta file is within the subject line, it automatically will suggest you which meta file you can save it to. So that is, in the day-to-day -day work, is very convenient. In the end, you can also drag and drop it if you like, but that's uh, only if it doesn't recognize it. What do we have here? Here we have the specific calendar of the view for one specific matter. So you can have a global view with all your deadlines, all your reminders, etc., or you can have it on a matter specific level, which is very good if you want to plan ahead for specific matters. You can say, okay, when is this deadline? When is the next one? What do I have to prepare? And you can also use this to collaborate with your colleagues. So you can put in new reminders or to-dos to for your colleague and say, ah, look, that week I'm going to be on holiday. Uh, can you please uh, make sure this and this is done, etc. So you can coordinate and you can not only see what Zoe does, but also what the rest of the team who works on this matter is, is supposed to do. What is very interesting about the meta files is also that you can um, granularly decide who can view each meta file. So it's not that everyone in the entire legal department has access to the same same stock of meta files, but you can really decide uh, this subgroup of legal uh, only can look at these ones, the contracts can only be handled by this other group, and the general counsel can obviously see everything. Um, and that is very important, especially with sensitive documents like HR contracts. So that also gives you a lot of flexibility. I'm going to run through the next ones a bit quicker. We have this one, this is a court data overview. So if you have a court proceeding, which is obviously not fun, you can put in all your data and all the, all the relevant things that are concerned with this court case. And you can also calculate prospective um, figures and costs that might incur uh, depending on how good you do in court. So that's very helpful in trying to also make some risk assessments. We have the legal spend management, as I mentioned before. If you have an external counsel or a law firm, you can document how much you actually spend for this prestigious law firm, and you can also see whether you're still in budget or not, and get an overview of also globally of all your different matters of where you stand at the moment. Because as you probably have heard, there's uh, the more growing, more finesse challenge in legal departments. So the C-level of the company expects more and more of the general counsel to provide and to provide more and more legal, legal help and legal services, but please for lower costs. So, and that is also something that you as a legal department obviously would communicate to the law firm that you have to look on your budget and that you have to lower the costs. As a result, more and more law firms are starting to implement legal tech, ha <laughs> ha, which is very good, <laughs> but it's going slow. Um, this is the template management which I mentioned. It's exactly like you can do it in general, but you can also select a specific matter and say, ah, oh, you know, today I want to have a new template for the so-and-so contract. You click on it and then you, you again select within the matter to whom you want to address it to and who will be the, um, the sender. And it automatically generates a Word document with automatically inputting all the data from the matter file, which is very convenient because if you have a very well um, kept uh, template ba database, you basically just have to alter a few things and that's very nice in your day-to-day -day work. Contract management, uh, very important, of course, it, yeah, in, in any company, I would say. Uh, you can document not only the same as you can in a meta file, but more specifically also until when is the contract uh, minimum uh, going to last, when can we cancel the contract, what are the, the, the terms and conditions of the contract. You can all display this in a very structured way and can also do a, an analysis like analytics across all your contracts afterwards. So that's very helpful for the entire contract management of a company. Yes, as I already mentioned, grant and IP management is very important for most companies as well. Um, as I said, we are mostly having companies as customers, so law firms is not so important for us. And this is one of our trademarks, actually. We once created a, a page called Sailbook, which is basically Facebook for sailors. So we also have to register this. <laughs> um, it's not up to date though, the screenshot at least. Um, so basically in IP management, you can manage all the same things you can do it with a normal meta file. You only have additional fields to take care of that. Right, here's uh, the additional uh, suite of our products, the Compliance Foundation Protection Tool I already mentioned. 
the collaboration tool is actually quite interesting when you don't only want to collaborate within your team, but also if you want to collaborate with other departments in your company, you can basically share a meta file with them and upload a few documents or templates. They can download that and then they can upload a new version. For example, if you work a lot with the sales department or the IT department and they want to have a say in the contract, that's an easy way to do it. However, you can also use it when working with law firms, so with an external counsel, that's also very convenient. It's basically like a virtual working space. Right, that's that. Um, our happy our customers are actually quite happy, I must say. Um, uh, Group Founder is one of our biggest customers. They use our software company-wide in all their legal departments, um, and we're very proud of that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's that. I also have now a little overview of what is happening in the legal tech world because I think that might be interesting for you guys who are just freshly entering this world and uh, I can tell you a lot is going on already. Mm. I can also tell you that a lot of people are talking a lot and what's actually happening is a little bit less. Um, but uh, a lot of people are talking about it and meeting up. And here are a few organizations that are actually driving this forward. So you obviously know the first one on the top, <laughs> the Brazil Center of the Legal Professions, and there are very, very many others. This is only an excerpt. The Codex Center is very famous. It's from Stanford University, and they also have like a legal tech index where they list all the legal tech companies that they know of, which exist at the moment. We have the European Legal Tech Associations. We are also a member of that. The Liquid Legal Institute, we are a member of that as well, which is, they're basically trying to, to break down the silos in the legal industry so that not like education, companies, law firms, you know, the judiciary, everyone's doing their own thing, nobody's talking to each other and they really want to foster collaboration in the legal industry. And that is very interesting. We are just launching a few different product projects to work on that, also to you know reform the legal education maybe, where well, I don't have a say because I didn't experience it, but I, I, I can emphasize. <laughs> and then very important, the Legal Hackers, which is a global uh, organization, which we're also a member of. I'll tell you a little bit about them afterwards. Um, and yeah, so a lot is going on. A lot of organizations have been forming. There are also some student initiatives, and I'm sure by now there are even more. There's the Munich Legal Tech Association, ELSA is the European Law Student Association. So there's also a lot of opportunities for you guys to get engaged during your studies, which is really cool. And they also organize a lot of meetups or events, which are really fun. Then, I don't know if you've heard of legal design as a, as a, as a term. Legal design is something, well, it's not that new, but it's basically the, the combination of design thinking, which is an innovation methodology, related and then applied to the legal space. And it's, it's basically about customer-centric product development or trying to create solutions for customers um, which are not um, designed from the producer's point of view, but from the customer's point of view. So there have been uh, a few like initiatives popping up. Very, very, like one of the first ones was the Legal Design Summit, which is hosting a conference in Helsinki almost every year. And uh, yeah, the Legal Design Lab, I think, was one of the first as well. That's also, I think, based in Stanford. So you can see Stanford is very strong <laughs> behind all of this. Then uh, we have legal operations, also a new term, which basically means uh, we apply business studies to the legal department. So for me, that was very welcoming because I knew how to do that. Um, and there are two huge organizations already. It's the CLOC and the ACC, which are mostly based in the US. And in the US and the UK, legal operations is already very common. And there are big, big events where people and general counsels share their practices, and they even have proper legal operations officers or head of legal operations implemented in the legal department. So it's something that's becoming very interesting. And overall, what you can see that means is being a lawyer is wonderful. However, in the future, I'm sure at least, uh, that in a legal department, let alone, let's not look at law firms, but in the legal department, there will not only be lawyers needed, but also legal professionals who have also additional backgrounds, like in business studies or in tech, or maybe in design, and there are many more disciplines coming together which will enrich the legal department of the future, at least I think so. So maybe if you have time, look right and left. Um, yes, let's look at a few events that are happening, and there is a lot going on, this is just an excerpt. Again, Vitalios is also doing a great event in November, the Herbsttagung, 
Um, next week, actually, there's a little gig, a little design gig. We have, actually, tomorrow, to come to Anhalt Congress, which is in Cologne. So we have a mixture of German events, but also international ones. Two weeks ago was the Nordic Bibliothek Day. So it's a lot going on, and I can tell you, three years ago, this was not the case. So it's really been accelerating, and the community is growing, and people are enthusiastic about what they can do, and they get together. And as you can see, there are also some hackathons taking place. I'll tell you a bit more in a second about those. Yeah, actually, right now. <laughs> so these are excerpts from a few hackathons we took part as we care. And they're mostly in Switzerland, in, in Zurich, or in Berlin. And it's always a great experience, and anyone can gym, can participate. So any of you can sign up if the, if you go like sign up early in advance. And it's really great because the groups just form at the event, and they're mostly diverse. So you have a legal someone with a legal background, a tech person. You always need a tech person. Without it, you won't win. And uh, you need maybe a business person. But mostly important in those legal tech hackathons, obviously, is the legal and the tech component. And it's absolutely fascinating what kind of ideas people come up with during this mostly one to two day event. So it's really fun. And yeah, we enjoyed it so much that us as a company, we've been really into it. And we not only attended legal hackathons, but also something called the Legal Design Retreat last year. And uh, we actually proposed a challenge, um, which was also relevant for our customers, to say, okay, how can we improve the, and how might we, is how you approach design thinking challenges. So we said, how might we, improve the collaboration between legal departments and law firms. And also there we had a diverse group of uh, candidates or participants from law firms and legal departments. And we looked at the challenge from two different sides. So from both sides, they went into separate groups and discussed how they would approach it. And in the end, we merged those, those ideas and ended up creating a really cool prototype actually, which we may or may not develop very soon. <laughs> so that is, no, it's actually so much fun and it's not only a great networking opportunity for anyone but it's just so inspiring to actually work with potential or actual customers on such ideas because two of those in our group were actually customers of us so that was really, really fun. And yes, we also did our own hackathon two weeks ago which was a lot of fun and Liana. Uh, who was in your master program last year. She has now joined our company and she also participated, so you can ask her all about it later. <laughs> um, yes, what do we else do we do? We come here a lot. We really like Pizzerius. Um, we also participated in your Legal Tech Lecture Series. And um, yes, apart from that, as I mentioned, we uh, engage a lot in the Legal Hackers community. So this is our founding team of the Hamburg chapter. We founded it a bit more than one year ago. And I'm not sure if you all know Dirk Hasel, he's also here at Voltaire's Law School. He was one of our founding uh, members. And yeah, we engage a lot in different kinds of activities. So we do legal hacker meetups, and they are also, they are co-branded with the Hamburg Legal Tech Meetup. So they, they take place, I think, once a month, maybe every two months, open for anyone to come. There's mostly a little lecture, but mostly at the end, it's like about networking, Q&A, which is really fun. Then we have a more informal meeting, which is the Stammtisch, <laughs> and that is taking place at the Themas Market. It's at Themas at the, this, this place, in, yes, Groß Neumark, that's the one. Um, and it's an informal gathering, also happening on approximately once a month. Anyone can join. We already had non-legal, just techies popping up and be like, ah, oh, yeah, so I'm looking about something in the legal tech space, who's interested? So it's also like a little matchmaking platform. What else do we do? Well, this is the Legal Hackers chapter map uh, from last year. As you can see, it has been growing insanely. And Brazil is growing so fast, you cannot imagine. I was just recent, last well, two weeks ago, I think, or three weeks ago, on an international summit, and they showed us the latest figures of which countries is growing the fastest. Brazil, wow, they're taking over the world. It's insane. Um, but yeah, as I mentioned, all over the world, this is uh, Susan from Lisbon, we met at the Web Summit, also a non-legal place, but you also meet legal hackers even there. So this was the event I was just talking about three weeks ago. We went to the US, we went to Harvard Law School, and then we had a summit for the legal hackers in Brooklyn. And it was amazing because we did not only get a tour of the law school, but we also attended the Harvard Legal Technology Symposium, which is organized also by students. It's the biggest student-organized legal tech event of the world, I think, something like that. 
Um, and this was actually in the Harvard Law School Library Innovation Lab, um, which is insanely cool because they tried to digitalize the entire case law of the United States to make it accessible to anyone. However, they obviously have some challenges because most of these, uh, most of this content is still owned by the big publishing companies like Westlaw and LexisNexis. So only until um, you know these um, these licenses, licenses, only when they run out, they can actually publish it. But once they run out, they will have it ready in a really cool way. So it, it is really fascinating. But apart from that, there was actually a conference here at the Harvard Law School, which is beautiful. We had this very renowned professor, Professor David Wilkins, uh, giving a great talk about the changing nature of careers in the legal space. And also, interestingly, how different still law firms and legal departments are made up. So, for example, legal departments, according to their study, still have about 70% of women and 30% of male. However, law firms have 70% male and 30% women. I find that hilarious, yeah? And he talked about a lot of different things changing, especially giving tech and all these new disciplines coming in. So that was very, very, very fascinating. And there, I think the story is still ongoing, so they will publish their results very soon. Also, a very renowned uh, author is Richard Duskind. I'm not sure if you've heard of him. He has published several books on legal technology, one of the first to ever publish about that. And he gave a keynote about his newest book about online courts, and that's actually only going to be published, I think, in November. And that was very interesting. And listening to his keynotes is always great. I think you can also find them online. And he's from Scotland, so you really have to get used to his accent. <laughs> but it's wonderful. And he also has statements like, more people in the world have access to the internet than access to justice. So you kind of get his like, intensity here. Yeah? It's really, really cool. And yes, after Harvard, uh, which was in crazy, um, we went to Brooklyn. And this was actually one more thing from this conference. Uh, um, the CEO of Rock Lawyer had a very fun presentation about the Ten Command Legal Tech Commandments. Um, love the law as it should be, of course. Uh, go all in, make money, laugh a lot. So he kind of tried to lighten up the mood a bit. That was very, very funny. So yes, this was the summit in New York. As you can see, this was the group of all the legal hackers who actually made it there. Completely diverse. I think there was hardly ever more or two from one country. It was like, I think at least 30 nations represented. We also represented our Hamburg chapter, of course. And it was just great. We looked at different, different topics to discuss. It was like a an organizers meeting only, so only if you actually organize a chapter you, you could go. And we also talked about how can we advance and open legal tech to the broader community, what can we do in open education and policies, and it's just fascinating how all these different viewpoints from all around the world come together, and you can see uh, maybe in Germany we have this challenge, but wait a minute, in Brazil there's such a different challenge. And at the same time there's so many similarities, so that was really cool, and a lot of initiatives actually came out of this. And um, I didn't put this into the slides now, but a really cool thing that we all said we wanted to start now is a computer, like an online course. It's called CS50 for lawyers, so that's computer science. Um, and it's an online course you can do on Coursera, or on Coursera or on YouTube. And it's actually by Harvard Law School, no, by Harvard. And it's the classical computer science introductory course of Harvard, just redesigned for lawyers. So if you're interested, you should definitely take it. It's gonna be a good. I, I can, I can, I can open it here afterwards. CS50 for lawyers. Really cool. Well, yeah, that's so much about that trip. This is our YouTube channel. If you want to subscribe, uh, we have always have a lot of different videos um, from different kind of conferences. We always look at different topics that we that we that we yeah hold keynotes on. So if you're interested, follow us there mm -hmm. or on Twitter. On Twitter, you can always see what are like the latest conferences and legal tech popping up. We have different accounts, also Instagram, of course. Yes, <laughs> well, and we have a blog where you can read more about legal tech. I had also prepared some slides about what is legal tech, etc. but I thought you probably already know. <laughs> so I think that's it. Um, my final say is that we're actually hiring very strongly at the moment. As you can see, Liana just joined. Um, we have different kinds of openings. You can always do an internship with us if you like to learn a lot about uh, a new, uh, like established legal tech company, we have part-time positions or full-time positions, feel free to reach out and contact me directly or on LinkedIn. We also have some little giveaways if you like. And now I'm open for questions after I drink some water. <laughs>
Thank you.